All right, let's go ahead and get started. Today, I am talking to Weiwei, and let's just jump right into it. Uh, Weiwei, I want to know what it's like to be you. Like, what was it like to be you as a child? What was it like to be you as a young person, as a young adult, as uh, I'm not sure how old you are, so like as far, <laughs> you know, kind of go through and go ahead and give as much detail or little detail as you want. And if you don't find it's interesting to talk about your childhood, don't feel free not to. You know, just uh, wherever you want to take that. Okay, that's cool. Thanks so much, Emmy. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, no, I feel actually pretty okay talking about my childhood. Of, uh, I'm going to just start by the most recent thing that happened, and I think I post this on the Discord server, is it, my, my father um, is definitely on some kind of personality spectrum, as is my cousin. And... My cousin is definitely kind of like a, you know, one of your standard sociopaths, the kind that are always doing shenanigans and pissing everybody off in a very overt manner. And my dad has just been kind of, you know, all sorts of different issues. But I was talking to him over the holidays, and then at one point, I stopped hearing from him. And I decided straight away, oh, he's shunning me. And then in my head, I started playing out how to get back at him for that. Mm -hmm. And I have in my life, as I also share on the Discord server, found some very tangible ways of just fucking getting back at him. Not out of anger, but out of a sense of justice. Like, you have this coming. And so there is a bit this weird contradiction between being able to be, like, super nice and sweet or whatever with, with somebody who is your blood relative, who you're supposed to have loyalty for, love, appreciation... And, you know, I can feel all those things, but at the core of that, it's, there's this other kind of vindictive, judgmental part, like, and also full of mistrust, if that makes sense. And so I, yeah. yeah. So I'm kind of like curious, like, why does he have it coming? You know, what is the thing that, you know, would be like, okay, now you have it coming? Well, you know, because like people's lives are not always the most orderly and like our parents divorced. My parents, well, our, my brother and I, my parents divorced and like 80% of it was his fault because of, you know, random shenanigans, gambling, you know, philandering, um, not paying the bills, all this kind of stuff. And so there was a part of me that's always like, well, you know, this is what you're going to get now. Um, um, and then as far as the other, it's also just a rubric of, of mistrust. And even if somebody is like, you know, because there's a sense in which we have family, we have loyalty, we have honor. And, and so at that moment, and I think writing it on the discourse servers, when I had that insight that uh, it, normal people just wouldn't go through that. They wouldn't, A, decide straight away that somebody not writing you back was not a sign that they were fucking you. And so that your instant response was, oh, I'm going to fuck you back. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. and, and so, and I don't know, that, that was kind of a weird tangent. I thought it would lead to the childhood, but it hasn't. So I'll just back up. And uh, they said I was born angry looking. Oh, this is a great conversation I had with my husband the other day, actually. I was like, because it's all about, oh, why are you such a social engineer, if you know what I mean, right? Uh, like uh, you orchestrate and manipulate situations. Right. Uh -huh. Almost unaware. And then... And so we were just having, because he's like the total opposite, complete, most straight out arrow integrity person you ever met. So it's kind of funny how we ended up together. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because that is also a path to being antisocial, because if you're, you have too much personal integrity, nobody can stand you, because then that's almost like being um, almost what they would call, I guess, Asperger's kind of thing, like when you're just so... Anyway, that, anyway, I was having a conversation with him and I just told him, like, I was a person who was born, I came out of the womb looking angry, I would smile at everyone, even before I could talk, I would do stuff like pull the tablecloth so that all the dishes would come flying out, mm -hmm. I was like screaming for attention, I would do things like I was saying where I would just wander off for hours without any awareness and in kindergarten I went under an assumed name and I apparently would bully kids steal their lunches I apparently one time wanted to not be in school so I pulled down my pants and 
peed all over the floor mm-hmm. i was just i was that fucking i was like a fucking monster i mean i was literally a monster as a child and and so then at some point and this is what i was telling my husband and he was just kind of amazed like wow shit goes deep and then i said you know pretty much since i first had consciousness i have had an awareness that i am like uh, repulsive to other humans for whatever reason yeah and so well what's the alternative you you learn how to you learn how to fake it that's that's all there is really when there's something in you that's so jacked up that you can't behave even quasi socially acceptable um if you have discernment and i don't know i guess intelligence you're able to figure it out and so i mean i could go deep and then i guess going into adolescence then you know your hormones come in and that's like really fucked because then all this other stuff starts happening that you don't know how to deal with and you know most i would say a majority of women if not all women experience some weird gross sex thing way too early because you know there's all these men running around throwing their vibe at you or whatever and sometimes it gets kind of gross and so you know i experienced some of that but it was nothing to write home about but what did happen to me is i became very angry at this person who was trying to you know imprecate me in some way and it seemed more like I was offended for the sake of my family's honor, just to put it that way. Like, it just felt like a, a, a lack of respect that I had to go through that. So I became like really hateful and horrible to that particular person. And then after that, I just went through this thing of, okay, I'm just going to shut down this sexuality thing. Like, it's just going to not exist for me. And so I became like, then I became basically a really scary person. Uh, I was in school. I was, I was basically like, I feel like I am half a chromosome away from being Columbine school shooter. That's basically who I was. Mm-hmm. I would not talk to anybody. I would wear crazy clothes. I would scowl at even the fucking teachers were scared of me. And, and this was like in part or not really like is this in reaction to uh the 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 person that you kind of uh you know you had like a uh tried to implicate you or was yeah this... kind of i would say that was a big part of it on the sexual end but also just it was a reaction to that was around the time that we all moved to america mm-hmm. i want to be in america mm-hmm. okay, and so there was america. a culture <laughs> yeah right <laughs> So there was a culture shock and then there was just hormonal changes and then there was dealing with this fucking guy and just it was just yeah for that first so from like seventh grade on till i (laughs) manufactured a situation where i would go back to south america to live with my father um that was my reality i was a weird scary person i remember stuff like i would opt out of pe just didn't want to fucking do it like fuck all you clowns i'm not doing this so i would sit on the bleachers <laughs> and it was funny because it was one day these two random girls saw me just defiant and they sat out on the bleachers because you know oh she's doing it we can do it the teacher went and told them to go back to class then the fucking teacher looked at me and i just looked at him like uh, just silently and he fucking walked away and left me alone. Mm-hmm. It was so brilliant. And at the moment, I was like, God, I can do anything. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I would like opt out of tests. I would walk out of class. But it was bad. It was isolated and it w- I was very unhappy. So it wasn't like good, right? Mm-hmm. Like I almost prefer your school story better because I felt like you got it at an early age mm-hmm. that not only can you participate, but you can make things happen but you have to not be in that weird angry place i guess yeah if that makes sense um i don't know um should i keep going or yeah well how long did the angry phase last or and how how did you get out of it or or is it still there (laughs) oh yeah i mean in big part it's just definitely still there like you know the craziest stuff will trigger me but i got out of that existential trap when i went back to south america and learned how to be 
a drunken reprobate and that's all I did and it was so fun and we went out and just partied and did drugs and were completely debauched and insane and that was fun but then that got old too because that's not very intellectually stimulating mm. and uh, and then I also feel like I obviously inevitably just wasted a lot of time um, you know I could have learned you know my musical instrument better all this kind of stuff but you know that's always been the problem like I, I have you know natural capacities I think we all do but that's not enough to carry you over what you need is um that commitment and that patience and kind of belief in the process the process oriented you know as opposed to goal oriented i sure that you understand what i'm talking about yeah and and like with music specifically if you are not in love with the process you should just not even bother yeah it is really interesting, huh? Like to uh, to sit down and to just practice by yourself. You have to like narrow your focus, almost like meditation. It feels like now that I've started doing meditation, but I, I wasn't meditating back when I was a music major, you know, but I was practicing like personally, like, you know, at least three to five hours a day. And then uh, wow. with with groups or ensembles, like another like six hours a day or something like just kind of, but you have to be so interested in the like most uh minute details yes in order to oh. be like constantly engaged because if you don't have like and that's one thing that kind of surprised me about being a music major this is a little bit of a tangent but maybe we'll get back oh, into no. something oh, yeah, okay. is that oh, you gosh. have to have a higher standard for yourself like that's part of being a better musician is just raising that standard for yourself to where you're like mm -hmm. it's no longer acceptable to just play right notes i have to play them with expression or it's no longer oh, yeah. uh acceptable to just play right notes with expression like i also have to play with like better intonation or it's no longer <laughs> you know like you yeah. just have to keep adding on things until you, you it becomes like uh perfect you know as perfect as as it can come from you uh so it's an interesting process and i i do think that that when i talk to people who are personality disordered like would you identify yourself as being personality disordered Oh, yeah. I mean, no question. I'm fucked. I don't know. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. And okay. I mean, are you like, are you necessarily like, do you know which personality disorder it is? Like, are you like, I've narrowed it down to these one, two, three or something? I really don't know. I mean, part of the struggle with, that I have with that is I can't get away from the fact that the whole like modern psychology system is to me, it's just a construct like any other. Like to me, it's not any more valid or invalid than freaking astrology because i mean aside from all the neurological little scans they've done there doesn't seem to be much more to it than somebody just came up with some random ideas and put them together and it happens to explain this cohort and yeah you can call these people psychopaths or you could call them potato heads and and it's to me it's like kind of all the same in a way but yeah I, I don't know i get that uh yes totally totally and it's kind of random how like it's developed it reminds me of law a lot where i'm like you know to understand oh. law yeah is largely historical <laughs> like this there was a jurisdictional fight between the the king's bench and the common pleas court you know in the 17th century and that's why this is the way it is huh. you know crap like that you know where it's like oh it makes sense when we look at the the progression of a river or something like why why does a river look so crooked it's because the water you know hit like a little pebble or something so started veering left you know and if oh, there weren't that pebble there and the pebble's long gone you know right but, yes so it's it's impossible for us to know now like why why things evolve that way but i think yeah to see psychology kind of any other way uh is weird to me you know because it's like if we had to start over with psychology do you think we would it right. would look like it does modernly i don't think so you know so i, I think imagine like yeah Yes. So, but do you think like of, of the kind of like, um, you know, the, the classifications, like, do you think psychopathy describes you to a certain extent, at least? Well, I mean, I just, I feel funny about that word for like the obvious reasons, like, oh, you know, Dexter or whatever the hell, or, or even just the people I read about. It's like all those people are 
way the fuck edgier than me like Mm -hmm. and so I can't relate and I also just feel like I am I mean I I I feel like I am an emotional person who manages in some form or other to bond with people so a lot of that doesn't resonate but when I start what I've been doing now is is just trying to grasp where other people are coming from and where I'm coming from and I have come to see that my (laughs) idea of bonding or caring about people is is pretty radically different from other people's and I'm even starting to see how and why Uh, just a brief example if there's somebody that I like or I'm friends with and it's like I want them to do something because I decided this is what needs to happen and they just don't want to do it because they're their own person. Right. Well, man, that's it's bad news for that person. Let me tell you that. Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. And it's like, uh, I mean, I've been kind of an average journal writer, but lately I've started doing this odd thing where I will write on toilet paper and flush it down the toilet. Because it's like, I don't want to hold on to all these weird, bad ideas. Mm-hmm. And for two days, I was enraged because somebody didn't do something that I wanted them to do Uh even though they had done something really nice that was different Uh. and that showed that they cared I did not even it it didn't exist all that existed was they did not do the thing that they needed to do so now they're going to die kind of thing and so if that is a rubric from which to that you know that particular um I don't know psychopathy or whatnot if that's what part of that is or what is another thing of oh, the whole attention, complete boredom, complete aimlessness or, or, I mean, you know, the thing, I guess what it comes down to is I would, I, I would accept that rubric just because uh, the simple crazy reason that ever since I started looking into this stuff seriously, I would say two, three years ago, uh, and I started sort of um, internalizing what was being said, whether it was old Hervey Cleckley I love that book that book cracked me up so much I almost died I know uh, yes, I love it. some of those people were like so cute I was like I wish I could have known that guy or or that chick I don't know but yeah and then I was like okay yeah I understand this empathy thing and it dawned on me yeah I don't have this oh well and I'm gonna act as if other people are other people or I, I just I guess I internalized and I started acting differently and it's like suddenly it was possible for me <laughs> to not only have relationships but improve the relationships I had and so for me it's like just from an instrumental perspective if this if me deciding that I'm like a psychopath or whatever is like literally giving me tangible results then I don't I don't have like a big problem um, identifying I guess I don't know yeah, despite your kind of hang-ups about psychology and the labels yeah. and the categories, the way they've developed. And, and this sounds weird, too, because uh, the other thing is, like, then suddenly it's like, if you have a label, suddenly there's, like, like, at least internally for me, it feels like now there's this standard of dysfunction I have to live up to. Mm. So there's a part of me that's like, oh, if I have this thing, then that means I need to go out and kill cats. I don't know what the fuck. I don't know. (laughs) Well, it's funny Um, you say that because I think people, I mean, a normal person listening to this probably, this is just my guess, normal people feedback if you think this is accurate. (laughs) But a normal person listening to this would be like, oh, okay, this is very cool that Weiwei, you know, has has used the label, I guess, for like what it's meant for, for like you know, self-realization and addressing long-standing uh, issues that mm-hmm. are, you know, uh, like consistent from year to year, you know, cons- oh, yeah. issues that are, because, you know, if somebody f- feels a little murderous one day, you know, that's that's not going to make you a, a psychopath. In fact, maybe it's not going to make you a psychopath, even if you feel it all the time, you know, murderous is not one of the, <laughs> one of the yeah. criteria or whatever. But, you know, like everybody has off days or whatever but yeah. if you're consistently this way then you we would say yeah you're disordered or something uh, generally it sounds like i mean just based on some of the stuff you're saying about like your your conception of your own personhood like your own self oh, yeah. uh, i mean it it to me i'm like okay yeah it seems personality disorder is an element to to what is going on uh with you 
but then you kind of go on and say like the thing that they don't want you to say which is and that's what that's what makes me think that i should like go be you know stirring stuff up because <laughs> <laughs> like so do you actually think that you, that gives you like uh um oh a license to do yeah. crazy stuff um that's an interesting question i never even thought about it i kind of almost at one point for sure at what when i first started like looking into this stuff i was like i don't know why this shit resonates with me because this is just not my reality for instance i just i've never stolen anything in my whole life once again mm. a lie because one of the things that my mother said about me is that I would just take shit from people's houses, but whatever. I've never been that. I've never been to jail, never stolen, never held up a bank, and I've never even shoplifted ever, right? But then after I was like, oh, I am reading about this and it is resonating with me, but I feel like this is not me because I don't fucking steal, I don't shoplift, I'm too nervous, I don't want to get caught. And then I was like, well, <laughs> If this is true, then I should be able to like go to sh shops and shoplift and not feel any kind of way about it. And so I did. I mean, I went for like six months. I went through this ridiculous phase where I just fucking shoplifted just to prove to myself that I could. Uh -huh. And then I think the last thing I I stole was like a, a book about psychopathy because I thought <laughs> that was like poetic justice, right? Uh -huh. and then i never really did it again so yeah so i did because i was like well and that was it it was it was a proposition right if i am this thing then i should have zero qualms just walking away with this thing and and you know i did and i mean i had a lot of weird like oh the shop the cops are coming after me blah 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 so yeah i know short answers i did go through a phase where i would like do crazy stuff because it's like well if this is true then i should be able to just do this stuff and not feel any kind of way about it yeah and, and it was kind of true i mean i kind of didn't feel any kind of way about it but what does happen is uh you set a precedent for your precedent precedent i don't know how to say that word yeah precedent yeah okay for your behavior and you know every human being kind of has to be aware of that regardless of their you know Yes, I've been thinking actually about that last thing a lot because, you know, there there's someone that I know who their mental health has been getting kind of worse. And it's mm -hmm. kind of hard, difficult to describe to people that she used to be different, you know, like because if you're constantly around her, uh, then like maybe, now. yeah, you don't notice the differences, right? Like you kind of, you know, I don't notice the people that I see day to day aging, but when I go see my friend who I haven't seen in a couple of years, I'm like, okay, aged, <laughs> you know, no, that's, like you're yeah, surprised so. that the difference, right? I think that's kind of a common experience, but I've mm -hmm. been thinking like, what is this kind of slippery slope that we have for, you know, things to like, I, I have never been, I don't think addicted, but like, I know somebody who just went to rehab for like, you know, this is like the fourth time now. And it's like, oh how, how do you go from, you know, like you're, you're just casually drinking to now you have an addiction. Like it really is kind of like this idea of setting a precedent for yourself. Like, I think that we all kind of inherently feel like that's a dangerous thing that, that we all need to watch out for. Right. Like if yeah. you, if you do this a little bit too much, then what's going to, because there's not a very uh, clear line between, no, there isn't. yes. Oh yeah. You're just a little bit depressed and now you're pretty much almost lost and you're like on the path to becoming homeless because yeah. there were windows of opportunity for you to change, you know, mental health and get help or whatever, but you didn't take them for whatever reason, you know, and now it's just, really hard like it's, sure. it's hard to kind of say to people like hey honestly i think that ship has sailed in terms of like mm. you could have just done xyz and you'd be okay now it's rehab oh you know now it's it's <laughs> it's something more serious right whatever it is and maybe there's not even a solution at all do you follow you probably don't on instagram i follow this uh, account called medicalpedia it's really... I've seen it. Oh, it's like yeah, all okay. the gross shit. Like, uh -huh. like the woman burned her fucking hand with like Drano four degree burn. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I was like, whoa, crazy. Now I'm anyway, going to yeah, that one because I don't know that one. But oh, that <laughs> you see, 
these people, the, the, the ones that are most shocking to me, I think are not like the, you know, workplace injuries or industrial injuries or something, which are pretty bad. And you do feel really badly for these people in terms of like, this oh, is going to change your life. Probably the fact that this has happened, but there not are, everywhere. yes, not <laughs> in a challenging way. Let's put it <laughs> that way. But then the craziest ones to me are the ones where you're like, okay, you clearly have a, uh, breast tumor that has like mm -hmm. taken over your entire chest and like has spread mm -hmm. to your arm such that it's cut off the blood circulation to you, the, your arm. Dear. And then your arm just died because it's not getting blood. So at first it turned to like gangrenous, but then it's just like, you know, bone and then kind of like this desiccated skin. It's just dried out or whatever. It's like mummified basically, but it's going to break off because, you know, they call it self, I think, auto amputation. Self like auto autophagia like when your body starts eating itself oh really well this one like and uh, i read too about an older woman who kept declining care for like this little sore on her leg until yeah it just mm -hmm. like killed the foot or whatever and then also the the leg yeah. that part of the leg auto amputated like it will do this or whatever and you're just like how do these people <laughs> like not and then you you read some of these things because everyone's always in the comments like well is this mm -hmm. curable like can they can they fix uh. this and you know, they're like, no, you know, yes, yes, they could have on day one. In fact, they probably could have on day 100, wow. you know, maybe even day 200, they could have. But at a certain point, it's like, no, we can't fix this anymore. You know, I'm so afraid I'm going to become that person because I hate going to the fucking doctor. I could just see myself as that cancer lady. I swear to God. Yeah, I, I could see it happening. Wow. Huh. I have a anyway that was that was just my little thing but yeah that's crazy and I totally see how you could uh, get to that point as far as the alcohol it's interesting because you know I had very I was a very serious drinker in fact I think my liver's fucked because last time I tried to drink I had three beers and I ended up vomiting blood so I'm trying yeah. to remind myself of that but I need to not do that, that but I, bad. I had the, no it is bad and so and what you're telling me is just reminding me that yeah maybe one day I need to do something about that but Mm -hmm. But the thing about alcohol, and I noticed because I would get drunk till I was unconscious a lot of the time. That was just my thing. And it was because it's that line that you're talking about. Anybody with a problem with alcohol, whether they are addicted or not, does not know where that line is. Because mm -hmm. there is a point, I mean, you don't drink at all, and that's kind of a choice, but there's plenty of people that just like to have a couple of beers, like to get a little buzz, right. you know, social lubrication, whatever. But there's a place. There's a line. If you you're feeling good, you're feeling buzzed, you're feeling great, and it's like a parabola curve, and you get to like the apex of feeling good, but then if you cross that line, you start to feel bad, and you start to lose motor function, and you start to stumble, and you start to behave like an idiot. And and at one point, when I sort of detoxed from alcohol for a while, it's like I learned to recognize where that line was. Mm -hmm. So for a while, I was able to drink up until that point. And it was cool. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's a, or even like you know, we were talking about a cousin who just wants to go out in the swimming pool. Is that okay to talk about? Or yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. oh, right, right. <laughs> uh, and and it's that thing about not knowing the consequences or not apprehending it in a real way. Yeah, how far can you swim away from the wall before your swimming capacity is such that you can't swim back to the wall? You need help, mm -hmm. or you're gonna drown. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I, I was a lifeguard and, you know, those were the people that I saved. It wasn't like, you know, these crazy, I mean, what would be the crazy things? You know, it was in a pool. <laughs> so it's not oh, like true. rip I mean, current was like taking them out the sea or something, a shark attack. You know, it wasn't anything yeah. like that. It was just people yeah. who did not know what the line was for them not to cross and they did cross it. And then once they did cross it, like, I mean the drowning death uh statistics are terrible like this happens oh. all the time you know to children to adults too where people just don't understand or something and it, it, it is really sad and tragic but it's also kind of it is an interesting question to, to think about like in terms of especially like a disorder and understanding like your disorder like how mm -hmm. how far like this idea of, of setting a precedent it reminds me i met this other person uh man his is arthur i think is uh, there's a youtube video of him too and arthur oh. would say you know he almost died once swimming because uh oh. you know he swam out in the ocean or something and then he got like pretty far out there and then he said, you know, he got really tired and the uh, the uh, water got choppier, a lot choppier. 
and he was like i'm gonna die out here <laughs> and so oh my gosh he was like luckily there was like kind of this outcropping of rocks kind of like a little jetty coming out into the water and he's like i'm gonna mm -hmm. use all of my energy and effort to just reach the closest rock you know and he didn't even oh, think yeah. he could do that but he's like well i have to otherwise i'll die and so he does wow. reach the closest rock and he's able to kind of uh what do we say um leapfrog regroup i guess Oh, yeah, from the yeah, the rock, rock the rock the rock, you know, and kind of like plan it like, oh, wait till it gets calm or something. But this like effort wow. of like hours of trying to get back in from the oh, my gosh. And he said too, because he loves to kind of like sleep in weird locations. So he said he slept on the edge of a cliff once. Uh oh. yeah, but then he was like, you know, had like kind of a, a bad like rolled rolled in the night and forgot where he was asleep you know and then had like a scare and then was like you know what i need to stay not just one step away from death but two steps because you can always yeah. is the problem when you're just one step away from death i was like yeah it is kind of like a, and it's weird like it's something that we have to kind of learn yeah. well my question about this guy is did that near-death experience make him want to do it more because there's a part of me that I don't know. I feel like if I was in that, I would have been like, oh, yeah, that was crazy. Let's try that again. I don't know. Well, uh, what about like it is like, oh, let's try that again. Like, is it the rush, the adrenaline or kind of like the playing with your own mortality, defying it in a way? Well, first, just to be clear, like I've never been one of those like physical people like I, you know, dirt bikes, Skiing, or even that I don't even really dive. Um, I never did that thing about swinging off the swing because I am kind of a coward in that way as far as my physical integrity. And I was never that great at sports, so it just it didn't appeal to me. But so saying, the few times that for whatever reason I was like in trouble or in danger, um, and I managed to pull through it in some way, it was very like stimulating I guess it was just like and there was a part of me that's like oh I did this I got out of this oh I'm so cool mm -hmm. and then I maybe try it again but there's also the aspect about wow this is not boring this is interesting like yeah we had a house fire and <laughs> my it was actually the upstairs apartment that burned but it was consuming the whole fucking house and so my first instinct was to go outside to the road and take a video of it because it looked so cool Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. I went in to rescue my violin, a Vitamix, because, you know, that's an expensive piece of machinery. <laughs> and, and I figured some other thing. And then I went out the road to take pictures. And I'm like, this is cool. Something's happening. Oh, my God. You know, yeah. and so like that. And so I feel like if I was that guy swimming, there's a part of me that would be like, I conquered death. I am the master of the oceans now. Mm -hmm. And uh, wouldn't be surprising if I'd been out there again doing that interesting huh that is kind of interesting uh and how do you experience boredom how does it feel to you oh i mean it's like it's let's see that's one of those things where it feels like there's a lot of cliche kind of stuff going around you know because when you start to hang out on poor and different places it's just like you know same old shit and so there's a part of me that's like oh now i'm gonna sound like everybody else mm -hmm. but I guess I haven't really formulated it to myself, except that it, it is is like uh, itchy. Like I start to just feel itchy. Mm -hmm. And if there's somebody near me, I start to act like really insane and childish and like really annoying, like a first grader with a crush on someone, just like poking at people, just trying to get a reaction. Or I'll just go wander around. It's like, I can't just, I, no, that's the thing that happens. It's like, it's like, it's like being, in solitary confinement, which is actually trivializing people in that horrifying life circumstance. And especially you as a lawyer, like that's the last thing I want to do because it's like when people trivialize PTSD, that's horrible. I don't ever want to do that. And so mm -hmm. I take that back, but it is very much like being in a confined space, but also it's almost like losing the narrative of your life, that's a big thing for me now. Like, I feel like other people have this narrative of their life and it's like a story. It's, and it lends cohesion and it, the narrative ties in relationships. Like, this is why this person is in my life. This is why they are important. This is your job. This is why that is important. Here is something you do well. 
that's what that is important and I still remember when I was like when I first tried to be in college and failed <laughs> I even remember back then thinking that and writing it in my book like my problem is that every day I'm I wake up it's like every day I am born anew and none of the crap that happened yesterday or last week or last month or last year it's like it doesn't exist or like it happened to somebody else or mm -hmm. I read about it so today I have to fucking start it all over again and that shit's exhausting yeah so then you usually just make stupid decisions like I'm just gonna go get drunk all day or I'm gonna go lech on this guy like or whatever don't ask shit I don't know that's it I mean I think to me that's the boredom that it's not having that cohesive narrative it's having nothing it's like being empty it's like and that's kind of a borderline place I think I don't know uh I think it I mean maybe uh the the things that I have well first of all have you seen the movie Memento yeah oh, no I did I yes I did but it was a long time ago yeah yeah I remember that, yeah. the guy who has to he has amnesia the like notes. every 10 minutes or something yeah and he yeah. has to tattoo the notes on his body but it is interesting because there there was another somebody who had like crazy amnesia like it was like every two minutes he would reset and then <gasps> his experience of his life you can everybody can google this was uh, interesting because he kept just repeating like i'm awake for the very first time you know i'm i'm conscious for the very first time and then he'd be like this is crazy you know like existence consciousness is just like wow you know because he had no memory of his consciousness so then he naturally just assumed okay this is like the birth of my consciousness two minutes later it's like the same thing i'm awake for the very first yeah. time <laughs> you, yeah. know? you know and it's a little bit like groundhoggy in this way you know i experienced this too in some ways oh. now i experience the positives of it because it's like let's say in my primary relationship with aria you know it's or like my career or anything you know it's like do i still want to be a lawyer today do i still yeah. want to be in this relationship today do i still want to live here today do i still want to identify this way do i still want to you know like i feel like there is almost complete freedom in my choices every day is like i mean i i honestly could just drop everything probably today and do something completely different tomorrow That's except true. for the fact that i am actively choosing it each day i'm actively choosing my profession i'm actively choosing my relationship and i think because of that i never get burned out the same way i see other people do it because if i don't want to be a lawyer today i'm not you know so i'm never like kind of just white knuckling through those types of things, you know, like I, I would white knuckle through other types of things, mostly kind of what you were referencing earlier. You know, you called it as something when you were a child, something that mm -hmm. just seemed, I forget what you said. I'll use the word abhorrent, you know, to people. Oh, you you're realize, repulsive, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, repulsive. You realize yeah. you're something that is repulsive to people. There's something mm -hmm. kind of that like vibes as unnatural to other people. Yeah. I've had people like really perceptive people, you know, these like really intuitive people before say that I'm like an alien after like meeting me for like one or two times, oh, you know? <laughs> like that's oh. a really common one, I think, an alien. I've been called that like a lot of times. Uh, you know, and it's just, I'm not, I'm actively masking when I'm talking to these people. <laughs> so oh, you're like, yeah, really I must be doing a pretty bad job with the whole masking. Like, wait till they see me not masking. <laughs> They'll see something that's pretty alien. Oh, they're going to see some shit. <laughs> yeah, some pretty repulsive, maybe yeah. abhorrent stuff. But some people don't have that. Usually the people that call me alien are like curious about it or whatever you know they're like they're not repulsed like the same way that i guess you know some people taste cilantro like soap and oh, some people taste thing. it like i know aren't you, i wake up every morning being like i'm glad i'm not one of those cilantro people because <laughs> I, I love cilantro as a flavor yeah. it's just and like it's really good it like cleans you out and shit like for real yeah but it's really interesting this is the first time i've heard this i think you said boredom you experience boredom as what'd you say an interruption to your life narrative oh it's almost like the, the boredom is is me kind of sitting there trapped in the fact that i don't seem to possess a cohesive life narrative yeah and so and 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 then so that's basically it's kind of like that guy that that amnesia guy Oh, mm -hmm. I'm conscious. I'm conscious. What the yeah. fuck am I supposed to be doing now? <laughs> right. Yeah. God, and I have no clue. Yeah. I bet people could see how that would get really existential 
you know, <sighs> like the sort of stuff that you'd be dealing with is different than the sort of stuff people would be dealing with that have a coherent life narrative. But I really identify with that too. I think that's, okay. I mean, this idea of like this disruption or lack of coherent life narrative is kind of like a little light bulb in my head because it's such a good way to put it. You know, I've just tried to describe before about certain aspects of myself. Like I experience my mo emotions out of context, you know, almost yeah. like I'm reading a book backwards, you know, page by page, but backwards, <laughs> you know? Oh, it's like the thing about, like the one you know sometimes like not now and again like i said a bad thing happened quasi life-threatening or whatever and at the time either it was like oh like i am lit by this experience this is amazing this is awesome i have to do something here finally i'm not bored kind of thing mm -hmm. you know, crisis crisis put out the fires blah 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 but then maybe like three days later or a week later randomly i don't know where it's like bam i would be hit with like all this weird fucking panic or fear and maybe have a little cry and just be like what the fuck was this i was fine two three days ago and now now it's like this whole thing like seriously what is this i don't know yeah well i have not still not read this book yet but my sister-in-law recommended to me a book where the guy's basically like saying like even if you're not experiencing your own emotions cognitively consciously uh at the time that you're kind of enduring them your body is right is mm -hmm. kind of the theory and that like you're retaining kind of that anxiety and i do think you know th there has been a lot of talking i think in the past few years about to the extent that people who are personality disordered you know specifically psychopaths but i think kind of more generally experience anxiety and i think this may be one of the reasons why is that like okay yes on the one hand you're kind of incentivized to engage in this risky behavior on the other hand it's not like it doesn't have any effect it kind of like like you may experience drinking differently than normal people but your liver experiences it the yeah. same you know <laughs> Right. Yeah. So le there are people that I know who were like special forces, military, and now PTSD. And it's at the time they're like, you know, this is nothing to kill people is nothing. And now yeah. they're they're finally having to kind of like reckon with some of the consequences of these choices that they made. So I think I think it's really hard because when you don't have a life narrative, like what uh it's uh aria kind of talks about this with her therapist that she has been working on having empathy for her future self and for her past self and i think in a way this kind of gets at this issue of when you don't have a life narrative you kind of like do things in the present that do yes. not honor your past self or they do not really respect your future self for the same sorts of reasons that normal people or any people cannot diet or make bad choices along the lines of you were saying earlier because that's like a real thing all 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 humans whatever they are are it, it's short-term gains are more cognitively rewarding than long-term effort i don't care whether you're a psychopath or whoever, whatever the fuck you are that's that is a real thing i mean i've known enough people who've tried to diet or try to whatever it is um, get up early in the morning to work or to know that this is a struggle everybody has but I, it's very possible that well it's kind of paradoxical because if you have this personality thing on the one hand it's harder to get off that instant gratification train i mean i am more than aware of that mm -hmm. but on the other hand it's easier to as well for the reason you were saying earlier yeah. that you do wake up it's a brand new day and i've definitely i've, I've been in that thing like you know what i'm going to i've just decided i'm gonna start jogging now and i have this goal that to the end of the month i'm gonna jog five miles every morning and i fucking did it just one day the next boom right or Good i'm gonna you. do the whole yeah <laughs> thing of course it lasted until i did it and then it got old so i stopped doing it but oh you know like oh when you do the thing oh now i'm gonna be a vegan now i'm gonna this that the other like it is paradoxically i think if you have this personality thing yeah it, in a way it's easier to make important life changes but it's also harder so it's like at the end it's like what i don't know yes i agree because i was about to ask you you know how would you kind of reconcile this you know with uh the kind of inability to have let's say empathy for your past and your future self with the fact that you i forget what you said that with in terms of social situations you are a not you didn't use the word orchestrate, but 
like a mechanic oh, or something? Social engineering. Yeah, social engineer. Engineering. <laughs> yeah, because like when it's not us, then it's like we can think like 15 steps ahead, you know? <laughs> I know, it's true. And it's like you can't fucking stop doing it. And, and, and um, one thing I've been doing a lot um, lately is just going through some process that is forcing me to think about things differently. And a lot of it involves altered states of consciousness in one way or another and I always get to a point there where I'm processing the day and I'm like god damn I did it again and like last night you know like I said I, I reached a point where I was like you know I have all these friends and relationships now but I'm not sure I trust the fundamental motivation that took me there and I don't like how easy it is for me to get this person to like this person and then to dislike this person and yada yada and I fucking going in there and doing it just because I can and I'm almost not aware of it half the time and you get this fiendish little glee about all this power you have but then mm -hmm. you're at a point where you're like that's a that's really fucked up like the thing with my dad it's fucked up and b it's it's just it takes I have to imagine it takes the joy out of it at least for the other people yeah I mean, well it, I think especially for you it takes the joy out of it I suppose I mean, I understand kind of the joy and, you know, I think, I think this is a very common trait of uh, people that kind of like lean this way is mm -hmm. that they are interested in power and why? Yeah. I don't fucking know. I have no clue. I've been like thinking about this and I think one of the reasons why, and you know, maybe this is like my own kind of bias slant because I have my own thoughts about like personality disorders and the connection to sense of self and identity. But I think one of the reasons why, at least for me, you know, from my personal experience, it feels like I sometimes, because you don't have this uh, cohesive narrative about yourself, your life, that sometimes you just want to see your impact. You know, it's like, uh -huh like throwing a rock in the, the the water and seeing the ripples you're like okay you know <laughs> I, I did that thing that's true i do that shit all the fucking time like do you see that person who's now working for that person i did that yes and it's like evidence that you existed you know it's yeah. evidence that you are because if you're constantly feeling this existential way you know like imagine what it is to kind of experience this and like yeah i think you would have like a kind of existential dread in a way that would make you kind of want to uh yeah. almost like that these people who feel like low sense of pain or whatever and they're like intentionally they're triggering right the pain you know yeah just to feel something in that particular area oh. because your sensation is so uh low and that's just one one easy way to see that you exist is to just see the ramifications of what you've done. I mean, that could be it. And it, it is because it does become addictive and it can become, I mean, there's some, um, you know, Foucault, Madness and Civilization. And I'll admit, I only read the first chapter of this book mm -hmm. because that's the one where they talk about like the Middle Ages and all this kind of stuff. And they were referencing this. Hieronymus Bosch painting the ship of fools and then Foucault was kind of thinking about it and kind of the gist of it was something like people understood back in the middle ages um, these artists and thinkers that human beings whatever you're as a person your natural tendency is you're going to keep leaning on that and using it and abusing it till it becomes folly and madness and so Hieronymus Bosch was one of those artists that was criticizing society how it was becoming completely bashed insane basically and the ways that it was going about doing that um Jürgen Habermas somebody else I haven't read I, I surround myself by smart people because I don't have the wherewithal to actually read a book for whatever reason mm -hmm. but uh, I still like ideas that are interesting to me Stick and Habermas if I remember correctly was talking about um science and how the path of science can itself become folly if you start sort of leaning in too much on the on the premises in a certain kind of way to the exclusion of actual reality and any system and any personality random example the enneagram i don't know if you're familiar with the enneagram at all a little bit yeah but it is actually kind of an interesting document because it basically talks about okay nine personality types but the actual point of that whole study is here is this personality type in its state of health, 
you know when it's it's functioning optimally and 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 everything is good and so here is this person with this particular virtue let's say the eights just because i'm sure a lot of us would be eights or threes on this spectrum um strong fearless courageous um, not afraid to work hard blah 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 but then once that person comes out of balance and you know enneagram starts out as a religious christian thing so it's about oh once you lose god or whatnot then and you start being dominated by fear then it's like you start using those character traits to your own detriment you know you become so courageous that you become foolish you become so hard working that you become a tyrant and and so on and so forth mm -hmm. and then the last thing i want to say is uh there was apparently Carl Jung had this quote about evil is the ego bending in on itself. Mm. So those are the four. And I promise you, I do not know what the point of it was. I just went on this total insane tangent. I don't even know what I was going with that. <laughs> no, it's like interesting things to think about because I, I do think you're right about like this balance of like, on the one hand, very Honestly. easy for us to change you know, because every day is new. On the other hand, there is a sickness there. Like there is, uh, and the sickness is, I think, I think you're right. It's existentialism. It's uh, an emptiness. It's kind of a, like, do you experience a sense of meaning in your life? Uh, very sporadically and short lived, I would say. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and, and usually it has to do with, oh, you know, just, um, I guess, it's very, yeah, very short lived, I would say, like so, minutes. <laughs> so I have like a theory, you know, and it's, it's, I, I want to say largely built on my personal experience, but also built on the experience of others that I've met, or I've probably met and talked to now. Oh, like dozens, dozens of people like uh, somewhere on the spectrum, either like with an actual diagnosis, some of them in forensic settings, you know, most of them mm -hmm. not. And oh, that would be, I'd love to meet some of those guys. I bet they're crazy. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're interesting. But they're, a lot of them are, you know, they're just different to a degree or something, like in the same way that you're different than I am, that like everybody's different, you know, like we, we share in common music, you know, but we don't share in common, like we weren't raised in the, the same country. You know, so it's like interesting to see kind of the differences about like, okay, you basically are me, maybe if I had been born in your circumstances, you know, exactly. <laughs> it's like a weird little parallel to kind of experience your own existence in these different ways. But one thing that I've kind of noticed about boredom, you know, like you say, kind of mentioned like Quora and some of these uh, forums. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people like boredom is a big thing. Boredom is something I think that people in the spectrum talk about and experience more than people outside the spectrum talk about with regard to us, you know, like mm -hmm. it's more prominent in our mind, I think, because we experience it. And which would you rather say you would, you, which would you rather be? Would you rather be like bored or like really sick with the flu, like throwing up? Oh, I'd be, rather be sick. No yeah. Doubt. Yes. I, I, I mean, in fact, sometimes like, like literally if there's not enough happening in my life, I become the world's worst hypochondriac. Mm, that's interesting. That's interesting how it um, manifests itself. So. I mean, it's, it's true. And, and that was, I think, one thing when I was reading your book and you talked about the appendicitis and I was like, oh, my God, I would never be that person because if, like, I sneeze funny, I'm, I, I, I go into the stale spin about how I'm dying. But then I remember that's not true because all the time, like, I, I broke my leg once uh -huh. and I still walked out of the fucking valley we were in. No yep. drama. And, if, and so... Yeah. Of, of course you would think that way though when you don't have a cohesive narrative of your life you know anybody could ask any questions about you and depending on like what frame of mind you're in at the moment they'd get completely different answers i know i know and when you start to become aware you're doing it it's so fuck it's like that herbie cleckley book right when i read that two years ago and i thought all these people were like spectacular like especially that one guy who had the weird drunk i love that fucking guy like i wanted to be with those fucking guys, man. That Which guy? Crazy. Oh, they'd like go to like have these crazy drunken things in like some crazy, like they were upstanding citizens. Uh -huh. most of the time. And then like one day a month, they'd go have this total like, not orgy, but basically like completely debauched 
And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I can totally get behind it. But I was so saying when I first read that, I was like, I don't, I have nothing in common with any of these people except that I thought they were hysterical. Uh -huh. But then I would like look back and I was like, oh, wait, yeah, I did do that once. Yes. Or times or whatever. Like the chick that urinated on somebody's clothes. Uh huh. Like, that's inconceivable. I would never do that. That's ridiculous. I, this has nothing to do with me. But then, hello, I literally did that in kindergarten. So <laughs> yes, this happens to me all the time, too. People, and that was what made writing the first book really hard is people be like, okay, we need like some, you know, whatever stories. I'm like, well, I've never killed animals. Then I'm like, wow, well, okay, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah, there's this one time, okay, you guys are right, I guess, you know, or whatever. Yeah, it doesn't really count, though, because it didn't mean it to be that way or whatever. Yeah, right? who knows? Who knows whether it counts? But it is interesting because uh, boredom, I think, is a little bit understudied, you know, in psychology. And I think for us, it's especially a little bit damning that it is understudied is because it is so associated with a lot of our most self-destructive and Shenanigans. other yeah others destructive behavior it really is it really is um and it's funny because my husband like i said he's so the opposite from me in temperament and he says boredom is the biggest crime there is like life is so wonderful beautiful so much meaning it's literally it's the only unforgivable sin and I'm like, okay, we'll be that as it may. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, like, it, like, try to experience a beautiful, wonderful world without a sense of internal cohesion about your personal narrative and see I if you like that. it, you know? <laughs> that's no, what I, I say. I mean, that's, no, it's true. That's true. That's true. But it is kind of odd to me when you start to think about... And, and I guess there's part of that too. The problem I don't like this whole like label thing is it, it just feels a little bit special. Like I don't necessarily have an investment in being different from other people. And when you start taking on these labels and things, that's what you're doing. You're otherizing yourself. So now it's special. Oh, now it's about my bloated narcissistic ego. Oh, great. But so, you know, so that's one one of the things I worked about my other thing the reason that is useful however and I persist in it even though it kind of makes me throw up in my mouth a little mm -hmm. is uh coming to terms with how different other people's internal experience is to yes myself. that and you start really delving into that and it's like holy crap like I literally live in a different I was telling that to someone the other day like I yeah, I literally had this conversation the other day with one of these local people who I've had <laughs> drama with. Um, and I literally told this person, like, you know, my problem is that I live in a weird little planet and only I live in this planet. Nobody else. Mm -hmm. And this guy's like, well, you know, okay, well, that's pretty interesting. And these, the fact these people are still even talking to me is a testament to I don't know what. Uh-huh. You know, but it's basically like me saying, yeah, no, I know, I, I know I'm fucked up. I don't know how or what to do about it, but I feel like you should know because there it is. Uh-huh. <laughs> that is where it feels like it does feel like living in your own little planet and only you live in it. Yeah. You know, I used to, do you know the book, uh, The Little Prince? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was yeah, growing up, I was like, thing. yeah, Little Prince, he lives on his own little planet. <laughs> he's to a total that's weirdo right. he's technically I an alien <laughs> that's right it's, but yeah he's got this weird robe and he's got all this title and yet no one it's, it's a weird little book i'm going to look at that book again now that was a crazy little book yes wow. yeah and people are like oh he's so charming or whatever i'm like yep mm. charming little weirdo just like me <laughs> also Not from really, a different yeah. planet alien yeah seriously man well like how long that you know because you went through your your process i mean it's been helpful to you right i mean I, it's really helpful to the rest of us whatever the fuck's actually wrong with us i feel you're doing a real service here because i really i feel I, no i mean like for real like yeah I, no i mean i appreciate it because it is kind of i mean people people i think often question my motives i just got a, a recent uh person questioning my motives not like in this bum bum way you know was just kind of like i can't understand why you mm -hmm. would be doing this you know like why did you give up like why did why are you you know being as out about this as you are 
kind of like mm -hmm. what's going on. And I thought, well, you know, the, the lack of meaning was just really rotting my soul is probably <laughs> the best way to answer it is like, I could not, did not want to live uh, I get that. like that. Yeah. Like if you've seen Memento, you see how the dude is struggling so much for, you know, no spoilers here for a sense of meaning mm. and purpose in his life that he's basically willing to do anything for it, you know, kill yeah. whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. and that's how I kind of felt. But I, you know, obviously I'm not going <laughs> to go that cinematic yeah. route or whatever and kill Hopefully, people for right. it because there's no Only meaning in that too. Yeah. But that's although, true. you know, I guess people do do that when they sometimes like they feel like their life doesn't have enough meaning. They, they need to join the military or they need to kind of, you know, do this start yeah. a revolution, whatever it I is. Fall in love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All these different things. And so for me, I was like, whatever this is, you know, like, yes, I have like success to a certain extent in certain areas, but I just, uh, I couldn't, you know, like I was, I was writing academic articles and I was super interested in them. They're very engaging. And I thought these are good and they, they really Law? are going to change things, but they, they don't change things. You know, nobody cares about was legal, it legal articles. <laughs> yeah. Legal oh, academic sure. articles. Okay. Well, I, mean, I should have told you that, mate. <laughs> yeah. Nobody yeah. cares about that. And who can, you know, the only people that care are like hundreds of people, you know, in the world or something, not even thousands or something. And then I was just kind of like, this is nice and this is a nice life, but I just, I, I want something more for myself. And then after I did find this something more for myself, like I, I thought, well, nobody is talking about this. And so no. this is more important than these legal articles. So I was kind of willing to make the trade because it was just, I mean, it was just, I think uh, I use this word all the time, unsustainable. It was, uh, what I was doing was unsustainable. Like I could have done it for maybe a decade more, two decades, so maybe. You would have fucking sit some shit on fire is what would have happened yeah the boredom or or the whatever else because these are like true issues and i think you know like this was kind of uh, what i was referring to before these these core people who are talking about boredom i think they they often uh think of it as like a trait it's it's a trait itself like there's something with our brains or whatever but i actually think that as you say and it's very interesting that you said it this way and you know i would have put it a different way but i agree with you i think the boredom comes from a lack of cohesive personal narrative and i think the cohes lack of cohesive narrative comes from a lack of sense of self because like if you don't really have like this core identity with which to kind of hinge things to then you're not going to experience you know your personal narrative in the same way you're you're essentially like the guy who's like i'm awake for the very first time you know except yeah. not that not every few minutes but maybe every day every week oh every day at least yeah, yeah. <laughs> depending okay. on how bad it <laughs> yeah, is yeah. yes yeah, <laughs> yeah and it's I almost like more than... no i was just gonna say it's almost more than boredom i'd call it fatigue yes honestly. yes fatigue yeah. uh world weariness is often the yeah. word that i use the phrase that i use and i think yeah. well okay like boredom is terrible like you would rather have like a really bad bout of the flu then have yeah. it. And that is a very common, uh, like I knew what your answer was going to be before I asked you that. <laughs> <laughs> if I right. remember when that Corona thing started going by, there was, I was like the one day I got, well, I was really, it's kind of weird. I was sick for four months before it, but then there was one day after I got over that randomly, I got fever and the chills and like, Oh my God, I got the COVID. And I was getting all geared up for that. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to prepare myself for this, thing that's happening to me and then like 36 hours later i felt fine and i was like okay dang it <laughs> i know but yeah you know what i mean it's like yeah so it's funny. terrible though and the cycle's really bad especially because as we say you know maybe you're able to kind of like cure the boredom by sleeping on a cliff or like going out into the ocean <laughs> and doing these crazy things temporarily because you're like oh yeah now i'm master of the ocean you know you get like right, this right. rush <laughs> of of whatever yeah. But your body, like, just like your liver is like getting shot by the day, you know, like, yeah. because like, we're not meant to live that way, you know, and it's mm -hmm. bad on our relationships. It's bad on our bodies. It's bad on our mental health. It's bad on our brains, honestly, because as we get older, our brains like less able to kind of process all this stuff. It can't think 15 steps ahead properly anymore. It can only think five and it kind of sucks even at like the fourth one that is wrong, <laughs> you know, yeah. the fourth yeah. step or whatever. 
so we're not able to kind of live the way that we used to do and i i think i see this like in the trend of like psychopaths tend to go through stages and this is actually is for for once reflected in uh i think the larger psych psychological community yeah that uh psychopaths mellow they say as we age you know we stop engaging in these things apparently. oh really yeah, like the just everything that's too all the florid manifestations of hallucination or whatnot just sort of evens out. Same with borderline, actually. A lot that's of interesting. Stuff, it's probably all fucking hormones. Is what it is. It could be hormones. Yeah, that would be one explanation. I think at least for us, I'm really interested in schizophrenia now. I'll have to start thinking about this. But but I think for borderline psychopaths, oh. it might be like a little bit of this. Uh, like we give up on the way that we were living before. We're like, okay, that's not sustainable. And so I have to adjust either now or later or something. And what are, what are going to be the ways that I adjust? And one of the things that I kind of suggest, and it's kind of interesting now that I mentioned it because I was like, maybe we'll end up coming back to this, <laughs> is that kind of through like therapy, through meditation, through various things, uh, it, and it's not just this, you know, when I talked about practicing music, you have to, uh, you have to <laughs> reconceive. It's, it's not just that you're interested, more interested in details. You have to have like a higher standard for yourself. And That's in terms of being a musician, in order to care that much, that you're spending that much time on increasingly small things that you know, 99.9% .9 of the public cannot hear. They cannot hear sure. these differences. <laughs> they cannot, they, they listen to you and be like, you sound great. You know, they don't understand yeah. it well enough that they'd even be able to tell. But in order for you to truly, truly excel in this area, you have to do this, right? You have to kind of whatever. And I think it's, I think it's true of personality disordered people too. You have to, at least for psychopaths, it's like you have to come up with a conception of yourself you do have to come up with a cohesive personal narrative. That is the cure to boredom. Because the reason why you're bored all the time is that everything is completely out of context. And arbitrary. it's also, yeah, arbitrary, existential, empty, meaningless. Like how do normal people achieve a sense of meaning even though they're doing like what we might think is the most like ho-hum life? You oh, know, how are they still? Are they? It's because like people, they're like an actual life. person. <laughs> I guess. You know, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to dedicate my life to baseball cards. It's like, really? Okay. And yes. then somehow I have hemped for that, but they're better off than I am. I they know. are better off. <laughs> <laughs> it's because for them, when they, the baseball cards aren't just an arbitrary thing. They are personal expression to them. They are self-expressing with all of these choices, these, these whatever daily choices, the choice that they make today to what they listen to on the way to work is self-expression. They're constantly self-expressing like an artist, you know, like a musician, like, like what we want to get to. We want to practice so well that we're at the point where it's just pure self-expression. It's not like, you know, technical, whatever. It's just like coming straight from our soul, like playing this piece in a way that nobody else can play. And that really is why everybody who is happy in life is happy. That's interesting because not my big fail as a musician is ironic, but I'm basically not remotely a performer in any kind of way. I only like to play really difficult shit that there's no way I could ever perfect it just because mm -hmm. like um you know i only took like two or three years of piano and yet i'm studying the Rachmaninoff third piano concerto just because <laughs> i can yes and it's like a joke in like a year i've gotten through the second page once but it, it's like it's like i am not remotely interested in either performing or perfecting this piece it's just something to noodle around and the thing is i don't think i've ever really that's a connection that's been missing like the performing part the self-expression part is literally what has been missing um i was gonna actually go to conservatory for violin at one point and one of my the teachers that was obviously that never happened it just blew away but the one teacher that was helping me get there told me oh my god you know like you have all the pieces to be like fucking I don't know what high fits or well not he was amazing not him you know what I mean like to be like up there like legit for real mm -hmm. performing violin blah blah you have all the pieces every single one you literally have them all you just have to put them together 
Yet nobody the fuck explained to me how to do that and I never figured it out mm-hmm. and I think maybe the missing piece is this self-expression thing I mean it could be oh yeah I actually I think that that's a really good analogy because you know I think that is that is so true of not not just people that are stuck the way that we are stuck but everybody mm-hmm. that is stuck is everybody has all the pieces they just haven't been able to figure out how to put them together. And that's what we call stuck, being stuck. Yes, for sure. Man, I feel so, yeah. And then, but I'm becoming unstuck too. And, and part of it, I think, is like if you're going through this process of, you know, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm different or whatever. And to be able to just accept that. Yes. And that helps you explain why you're stuck. You know, like right now, I mean, I'm at a juncture right now where I, I am anticipating that all my friendships and all the relationships I've developed for the past year could easily just disappear because I had like a really bizarre, unhealthy um, foundation for all of it. Right. I just did. It's just the way it is. And kind of right now I'm trying, to, and I've, that's happened to me before in the past. And in the past, it's been like, okay, we're just going to randomly pack all our bags and move across the country because this shit's played out, right? I've done yeah. that like four or five times in my life. And now it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to sit here, do my best, try and be useful, uh, atone when I need to, explain myself when I need to, and let the fucking chips fall where they may. Because it's like you said, it's like at some point you just run out of steam. You're like, I'm done, I'm done. If I have to live a, a damn recluse on this hill and do what I can to get by, so be it, you know, it's yeah. fine, you know, I, I just, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And at least now I know what I'm doing. So you go through your life, you don't even know what you're doing. And that's the sad part. Yeah. But then once you realize you're doing something, okay, well then half the time, I'm not even aware I'm doing it. And then I go home and I sit around and meditate on it. And it's like, oh yeah, I did it again. Ah, oh, shit. Okay, well. Maybe I'll do less of it tomorrow or, or whatever. Or maybe, like, I've talked to some borderline personality, and I still, I'm, to be honest, I'm, I'm still not even very clear that borderline and psychopathy is all that different. But mm-hmm. maybe it is. Like, all I know is, like, I relate a lot to what those people say, but I also find them kind of, um, it's hard for me to talk with people who are so <sighs> emotional, I guess. I don't know. But so saying, it's like there is a very similar thing there. And like I've talked to some of those people and, and they've literally said, I realized in my 30s or 40s, I am incapable of having a romantic relationship. It's just not possible for me in any capacity. Therefore, I am just not going to do it. I've been single for 12 years. And it's the only time in my life that I have been stable and happy. And so I'm like, well, you know, I can see why. Sounds like a hard decision, but I can see how you know, you could get to that. I could say, you know, I'm never going to be able to like hold down a job and make money or whatever it is. That's fine. I, I'm going to just accept that. I'll just try and stay out of trouble, keep my nose clean, honor the people who've been good to me. And, and that's it. Fuck it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I went through a phase like that. Uh, it was like, basically, I mean, pretty much right after like the book got published and stuff. I was like, okay, very different mm-hmm. life now. <laughs> no longer a law professor, you know, like yeah. in the, in a lot of different circumstances. Had some question, like I had an Excel spreadsheet that was like, okay, here's my savings, you know, here's like my retirement accounts, here's everything. Like, when can I retire? I should be able to retire with like, mm-hmm. you, you know, some some struggle still, but like at fifty nine and a half. So I just need to make it X number of years. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. let's just spread yeah. out the savings, you know, and I had like some question about whether I'd be able to like, do anything you know, work at Taco Bell. Yes, exactly. And so I had like this Excel spreadsheet that was like, okay, you know, just the years of my life where I just thought I just need to kind of what you say, you know, keep my nose clean, just like, yes live live the best according to other people's standards you know do what yeah. i can to try to like meet their expectations but it was the total wrong answer you know it's like uh it, mm. there's that's not sustainable like there's no way that you could do that for more than <laughs> maybe even a year or two yeah, that's, that's true hmm. i guess what it's about is just like i guess what i would 
what what the thing that sounds good is if you and i think i've talked to you about this before that if, if you have some sort of you know because there's like some sort of skill set there there's like a machiavellian thing there's a diplomatic thing there's a oh yeah you know i mean it's like a real thing and i'm sure in, in your law career that's like really useful to you but um the, i guess the ideal would be to find a way to use that deploy that if you will where it matters Mm -hmm. when it matters but to to be my thing is to be able to have relationships with people where it's not about that at all like let's say you're married or you have a friend or whatever and you can just fucking like be friends and and not have any of the crazy machinations coming into play yeah that's the thing that gets me like because i feel like people are good at that at having these um i don't know i don't want to say boundaries but or whatever you call it compartmentalization almost like this is just my buddy i'm just gonna let them be my buddy and we're gonna go hang out you know shoot rats in the train station or whatever the fuck we do and then just is that a reference to uh sweet and lowdown yes <laughs> <laughs> i love that movie oh my gosh the hattie character is just like oh yeah. my heart on this one and speaking of kind oh. of like these people who like you know their tumor or whatever gets to a point where where he's like i made a mistake but it's too late you know it's too late and yeah. <laughs> it's that's funny right. that's right because he did that he, he wasn't he took that chick for granted completely yeah mm -hmm. just didn't even see and that's and that is a I have been in that guy's place many times, like my, definitely in my marriage for sure. You know, when mm -hmm. you get to a point where you're like, oh my God, this is what I've been doing. And that's a horrible place. Like one time I started like hyperventilating. I thought I was going to pass out because I was like, I don't know, it's like it just hits you all at once. Like, wow, I've been doing this. You know, but you know. using the plot of Sweet and Low Down though, and we'll we'll try to kind of wrap this up because I, I told you earlier my my limit is like a physical one of how long can I sit in this chair. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm and I'm already sure. like getting uh you know like my butt's falling asleep a little bit. <laughs> from the, right, right. Yes. So uh you know in this movie he wants to be like Django Reinhardt. He's a jazz right. guitarist like in the 30s, 40s or whatever. Right, there's a bunch of spoiler alerts, guys, but still probably a good movie worth watching or something. So he wants to be Django Reinhardt, but and he's like obsessed with uh, Django Reinhardt, and he keeps saying he's a total narcissist kind of guy. You know, not narcissistic personality disorder, but kind of like very uh, thinks well of himself. And he's always like, I'm the best guitar player in the world. He's like, except for this gypsy in France, <laughs> who's Django Reinhardt, right? right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. And so he's always saying this like blustery thing, but he does acknowledge that Django's better than him, right? But people are like, kind of what we were talking about, what's the missing piece, right? That's also the plot of this movie is like, he's never as good as Django. And why isn't it? It's only after his heart is broken by the mistake he's made that he plays with any amount of feeling. And it's like That's an actual right. self-expression. Yes. And then oh. people are like, and that, that evening he was as good as Django because he finally was mm -hmm. just being himself. Because as much as he, I mean, he's a total weirdo. He likes to shoot rats with guns down right. by the train yard. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> That's yeah. his like way of kind of like letting off steam or whatever, you know, but, uh, and he's, he's kind of unabashed about certain aspects about himself, but this, oh, yeah. this woman he falls in love with Hattie played beautifully, I think by Samantha Morton. This is, uh, yes. who, what's the dude's name? Who's the actor who plays the main Sean character? Penn. Sean Penn. Oh yeah. Sean Penn. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. So Hattie, his girlfriend, uh, is uh, mute right? Not deaf mute, just That's mute. Right. Nobody knows why, right. right? And he kind of, uh, yeah. when he first meets her, he's, he's like, kind of well, a mousy girl too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, he kind yeah. of remarks in front of her, you know, like, oh, I get the, kind of the broken girl, you know, you guys get all get the, <laughs> the good girls and I get this like broken one. So he's kind of mean to her and you can tell that he's always a little bit ashamed that he's with the broken one. And then for a while he like dumps her and starts dating, man, is it Uma Thurman? Who's the right. one he's, Somebody like that, like, cur yes. like curly blonde hair. Uh-huh. Yeah. Totally yeah. Hair. 
Yes. And because he's kind of getting better, he's getting well more well known as a musician. And he's like, I can't have this mute as a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. You know, she's like not flashy mm -hmm. enough and everybody's going to make fun of me. Right. So he chooses because of like the perceptions of others. He doesn't want to be judged for having this this mute girlfriend that he chooses to dump her. And then, you know, his life gets worse, right? And then he realizes eventually his mistake, but she's like moved on. She's like married, has two kids or whatever. And he made this choice not based on, again, self-expression uh, or whatever. He made the choice based on fear of what others would think or, yeah, fear of what others would think. Kind of like how we mask. We choose to mask all our yeah. lives or we choose to, you know, like, I guess I'm just going to keep my nose clean and you know, just try to be what other people expect me to be finally or whatever, as if that's not what we've been trying to do this whole time, you know? <laughs> I, I will say that. Yeah, that reminds With zero me success <laughs> or mixed success. No, you know? yeah. Yeah, and then he ends and up like sad and alone. Because he didn't understand about the bond, I guess. That's what that was, like how valuable well, that is. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the bond, but I think he also too was, he was just making too many choices for outcome, you know, he wasn't processed. He's like, I want to be a famous guitarist, not I want to be the guitarist, the best guitarist I can be, you know, that, that I appreciate, sure. even if nobody else appreciates it. Or like, I want to be in this relationship that makes me fulfilled, even though right. other people judge it. That's true. Or even the whole musician, that's like a bizarre motivation for being a musician. I want to be better than that guy. Like straight away, you just get rid of like the whole point of doing music. I mean, I don't have the right motivation for doing music either. I just do it to keep my mind occupied. But that guy, in my money, had a way worse motivation. Yeah. Yes, it's a little like your relationships, though, too. Is, isn't that what you've been trying to say? Is that you've been having a similar kind of weird motivation for your relationships like what even is your motivation for making keeping and maintaining relationships well there is actually that is the one thing i'm definitely glad i get a chance to discuss on here and it's something i've been thinking about a lot lately it's i am very allergic to put it that way to having people be unhappy or displeased with me mm -hmm. which is kind of a very that's a hard um goal to have is everybody's either happy with me or they don't know i exist and if yeah. anybody's even remotely unhappy or unsatisfied even if it's for like a bullshit reason that has nothing to do with me that like now i have to go try and fix it and, and if i can't fix it then i get angry at them and i want to you know hit him or something i don't know i'm just saying that um that's is that a fundamental motivation it's definitely a part of it and so what i'm realizing now is I need to somehow learn to be comfortable with the fact that people are sometimes just going to be annoyed at me or mm -hmm. unhappy with me or don't want or need anything from me or that we're just going to disagree about bullshit or reasons or good reasons and I just have to be able to sit with that let them you know the you do you thing me do my thing and just not give it any energy or worries because i do like if i feel like somebody's not happy with me then i want to go uh just i create this whole fucking thing in my head or external reality to either have the person no longer be unhappy with me or to fuck them if they're unhappy with me <laughs> and, 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 and and so i have been practicing with just even here in my you know with my husband like okay he's not happy with me right now okay i received that that's true that was fucked up thank you for teaching me i have learned my lesson or that's just his dumb shit it has nothing to do with me yeah and i'm just gonna go about my business and tolerate that space and then you know yeah maybe. and so i don't know if that makes sense but that's for me right now like that's a big thing for me right now is i'm just gonna do the best I can and if people aren't happy with me well fuck it kind of thing that's awesome right because know. even if let's say they are wrong to blame you for something they still have the right to be wrong I guess huh. They do. Right I mean, yeah, that's their that's their choice, right? Everybody lives their own reality. Everybody lives their own personal narrative and if that's I mean, it could be get to the point where you're like, okay, that personal narrative you have <laughs> is so different from mine 
that it makes having a relationship difficult and or impossible. But in the moment, yeah, they have that right. I mean, you don't have to stay in the relationship with them thinking that way, but they do have the right to make that choice. No, I suppose that's true. And that also goes with, and that's the thing right now. I'm also is like wanting to get involved, like, oh, you're about to make a terrible mistake. Oh, I have, and I can do something to make you not make that mistake. And now I am like, no, <laughs> I think it's because of what you've been saying. Honestly, the free, free will or yes. that thing about agency, they had yes. to make that mistake and that's it. Um, yeah. You can ask them, hey, would you like some advice about this? I think I have, you know, something that might help. Are you interested in hearing that? <laughs> they can they can say yes. But then if they if, if they it's... listen to you and still choose the opposite or whatever, it's got to be like, this is your choice and I respect your choice, you know? And then you have to like not be invested in that. Yes. In process well, oriented. I guess I don't... <laughs> That's right. I mean, I've been thinking about that a lot. I've been thinking about a lot of the things since we last talked. And the only thing that I hadn't really succeeded in was the thing about actually getting up off my ass and doing the thing that interests me. That mm -hmm. was, that that was like the final step. Yeah, that one's hard. And I have to say, you know, like, where are we right now in the pandemic? Uh, you know, people mm -hmm. might be listening to this, I don't know, later or something. Uh, is where, at least where I am at, you know, geographically in California, like a lot of people are vaccinated. The The numbers are very low, but stuff is still kind of like bum bum, you know, like if you want to do something fun, you have to plan it five weeks ahead of time and reserve it. Otherwise the reservations are gone, you know? So it's like, I think right now, everybody is having a hard time kind of coming out of the pandemic because they've been stuck in this kind of world reality situation that is one way uh, but it at least had some, you know, uh, some good points, you know, at least you didn't have to like show up to work. You could stay, I mean, like uh, these zoom oh, conversations, yeah. I don't even, maybe two of them. I've like worn a bra, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's been like, you know, life is like that. Right. So that's been nice. Right. And then I'll, I'll just go down and work at the beach or whatever. Uh, but yeah. now it's like, we have to kind of ramp everything back up, you know, to the level mm. that honestly, some people didn't like before, you know, of like having to like mm. wear office casual and go and meet people and talk business meetings, whatever, you know, stuff like that. But there's All still, the oh, yeah, <laughs> it's still like people are bum bum to you if you're at a bar and you're not wearing a mask or something, you know, because oh, yeah. oh, you know yeah. stuff is still very tense or whatever, especially the fun stuff is still pretty tense. And so we're like, we're getting some, we're not getting all the normalcy of life back uh, equally. We're getting the worst of it, I think, first. <laughs> and people just have like this kind of burnout uh, from having had to deal with it. So I, I would say to everybody kind of right now is just be merciful with yourself. You know, like understand that, like I have a reminder that's like do 20 push-ups, and like often I just am like, nope, not today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fuck that shit. Uh, no. Yeah, be merciful to yourself because you know yourself better. I'm. I've been spending like the past uh, couple days just watching Saving Private Ryan. You know, <laughs> because I'm oh, like, oh, whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've never seen it. Yeah, like just, just uh, it's fine to not. It's fine to be easy on yourself right now. It's it's a good thing. And you should always, I mean, you should always be aware your own intuition can tell you when it's, because do you need to make all your life changes today or this week or next week or something? Is there some um, rush? Yeah, yeah. Not really, but my whole thing is if it doesn't happen now, it probably won't happen at all because I'll forget or lose interest or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe ask your own intuition your intuition would know best like even if it's something like maybe that is true but maybe there's something easier that you can do that'll keep you engaged enough just like in music right if you're having a hard time with whatever bowing or something switch to like pizzicato stuff switch to you're just doing left hand work switch to your you know there's always you switch to the piano there's always something that you can kind of do and like think I would have faith in yourself because if you've kept with music this long, you will keep with uh, self-realization, self-actualization. Well, I, I feel like I really need to actually, that would be the thing that I have somewhat committed to is I need to keep the music thing going. The violin specifically, um, 
it just it really like addresses that weird neurotic part of myself i mean i'm not sure that's the right word but you know that brain yeah whatever. it's interesting because when i started playing you know as, as, as i had like serious behavioral every kind of issue when i was a child as i said but the thing that helped me get out of it was when i started playing the violin when i was like seven or eight or something because mm -hmm. i was able to channel all this bizarre crap into that and it really worked for me yeah and so i'm just looking at my life now and i'm like i just think i need i need that i need to lean on that i really do because i'm trying to stop externalizing that hamster wheel onto external reality or other people or whatever it is but it needs to fucking go somewhere and yeah. i demonstrated it like whatever 30 40 years ago whatever it was that this thing does it because i was in a really fucked up place when i started playing violin like boo mm -hmm. scary but and then like pretty i would say like within a month or so all that weird crap went away yeah and if only i had stuck with it you know blah blah but so saying i think i i now have almost like and that's the other thing you only want to do things for a reason is there a rationale is it worth the effort cost benefit ratio i'm seeing right now that you know, once you're doing music and you give up on ever being any kind of performer, you just kind of lose the motivation, you know? Right. Like, what's the point? I might as well play Scrabble. But then I am starting to see that it might be a fundamental part of my wellness and mental blah, blah, blah to do this thing. Yeah. Because I'm sure you understand with the bass, you have to get to some really intricate shit, right? Yeah. And, you know, music's interesting for me, too, because I kind of for a long time, like I, I gave up on music here and there, you know, but I always come back to it. And I think it is because, you know, it's not something I have to white knuckle to do. It's actually something that feels like a release to me. Yeah. I do think it is self-expression. So I think like, as you, you know, I've never seen kind of a, uh, you know, somebody let's say that who's like us kind of backslide mm -hmm. too much you know, or for too long about these things. So I wouldn't worry about it like it because you can't go back to the way things were. And if you don't know that yet, you will you will realize it soon. And that there, there's no kind of error there. <laughs> like there's yeah. just like that's just a truth. Capital T is that you once you've seen something, you can't unsee it. Right. That's and true. so you'll know, like, okay, no, that was like not something I even want to try again. Eventually That's you'll true. you'll get to that point. So I wouldn't I wouldn't stress about like, oh, it has to happen this way, or if it doesn't happen now, it won't happen at all. Mm. Because this is not like this is the one thing in your life that's not gonna feel like white knuckling. That's not gonna feel oh. like something mm. you have to force yourself to do, otherwise you're gonna slippery slope, <laughs> you know, end up being an yeah. So it's a pretty safe, <laughs> I mean, it sucks. There's a bunch of things that suck about it, but uh, overall it's awesome. No, I could see that. And I could see, um, you know, in a way you take a hit, I guess, like um, it, it, it comes at a cost and I had you know talked about it before, but it's almost like, I feel like the one advantage is we have the ability to take personal costs or to go through hardship yes yeah and i actually one thing that i've been saying kind of recently uh even to my family friends you know like being just like more out in general to everybody you know like there's nobody there's not really anybody i wouldn't tell in my personal life no matter how weirdly remote <laughs> anymore and one of the reasons why is i just feel like it in some ways it's been such a blessing because i have never been tempted to just like you know, live my life for another person, you know, because that that's never been appealing to me. Like I know a lot of people who do that. They live their life for their parents. They live their life for, you know, maybe their kids. They live their life for oh, a spouse. They live their life for their boss. Right. And, and even just a little way, like even if you're just doing this 3% of the time, you know, that you know that there's something lost there is living your life for somebody else. And I, you know, when people become kind of self-actualized, they have to let go of that, right? Yeah. And I think the yeah. one thing that's been really nice is that my life, the way I have lived my life with my disorder has always been so unsustainable that self-actualization was the only choice. You know, I've never been able to, 
never been able to just slip by on like you know so some of this other yeah. stuff that normal people do and oh, and the, yeah. so in a lot of ways the disorder was a good thing for me because it kind of forced me to uh, not just settle for less than what life could be and to to actually seek for like as awesome as your husband says life is yeah. Yeah. and like yeah. nothing yeah. less you know and until well, i finally got there what was interesting to me about you is I, and i i'm trying to figure out at what point this cultural, the culture became obsessed with these personality disorders? I don't know. Maybe you know the answer to that. But at some point, some very specific point, this whole issue with this thing became in vogue in some way. And then you had all the Robert Hare and all the like angry, hateful people with their stuff. And then you had all the boosters with the stuff kevin dutton and whatnot and it's just like mm -hmm. i don't know like it blew up and so but it's here you managed to and i think you even said so as much you were positioned to come in as a representative of this cohort like here i am i'm raising my hand and let me help you all you stupid motherfuckers figure it out because there's some real shit here and so that was very providential i feel like for you yeah circumstance and it took a certain amount of courage to raise your hand up and have to have these people you know fucking i'm sure robert Hare loves us and that woman who's like oh i just got bug on my butt about this chick <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. is it crouch stout or something yeah. martha stout yeah sociopath oh, next door <laughs> yeah she's, she's so envious like i just mm, i don't know but anyway these people Yes, but they, all the other people, they're not helpful either. Because like Kevin Dutton, he's just a fucking like booster. He's like a, a fanboy, and that's not helpful either, right? Mm. That's yeah. my question. Why should, do you know when this thing blew up? When the fuck did this thing just become a thing? I don't know. Kind of when it it did. You know, I'm not really surprised. I find in the law too, you can see like a lot of this of like where you know there was there's just like thoughts like uh, philosophies uh where they just kind of came in vogue or whatever and they they reflected like a larger societal change often you know but mm -hmm. they're, they're just kind of interesting because some of them i think okay law and economics i really appreciate but legal realism i don't really because legal realism one of their beliefs is that law is something to be discovered like a natural law like physics oh, or something and i'm God. like that doesn't Fucking seem pyramids. right. <laughs> you know, that was like in the twenties, thirties or whatever. And you're like, I don't appreciate legal realism as being an advancement. Yeah. I think it was, you know, pseudoscience, right? But I'm, I guess we kind of come in these waves, you know, like with the, the, the ways that we're thinking about things. And I think we just happen to be in like this weird, basically the equivalent of legal realism for personality disorders where it's like, yeah they've true. they've kind of been in vogue but it's like also we're debunking i think a lot of this stuff or like you know why study this but not this for instance about boredom you know like i'm yeah. not saying that they're wrong i'm saying that the the overall way that we think of it is not like a good clear way to keep going forward i guess <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, and i'm with you and, and part of the thing that i going through is how the fuck did i become part of the story like i have no fucking clue well i actually think you know None. you say kind of providential <laughs> and it's interesting because i think one of the the things that has surprised me is that my life is so much better than it ever has been now even yes. though like a lot of people would be and i've heard people people email me or like is your life okay because i'm truly worried for you <laughs> 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 but it's been interesting oh, I because I could not, and I've said this before in other interviews, I could not have orchestrated to this point. Like there's just too many weird little things by being authentic yeah. in relationships. It's led to other opportunities, other, other ways of self-expression, other professional, other personal, other like where I live, you know, it's just like led to just like things that I couldn't possibly have just, you know, planned to better better things you know and i used to be kind of like jealous of my therapist because he was so good at what he did you know there were so i was like he has outsmarted me this whole time <laughs> you know oh, that's funny. i was like, like i was 
yeah, impressed. You know, I was like, he is so good at what he does. And he had previously, you know, I'll, I'll use this just as a quick kind of euphemism. He had like cured my brother who was so messed up. You know, he was so messed up from like our, our shared childhood trauma. Oh, was that sensitive one or whatever? Right? Yes. You know, and yeah, yeah. My, now that brother is like one of the most like sturdy, best, like you can rely on oh, him nice. for anything. Like, I mean, such a turnaround. And it was like in 10 months or something. I was like, this is huh. some sort of like real Rain skill. Belly. Yeah. Yes, that yeah. he has or whatever, you know, and it's lasted this long. And he's he just recently passed away last month, you know, so RIP. Oh shit. Yes, to him. Right. That's yes. Oh, that's a loss, dude. Because yes, not everybody's it... like that. Man. No, hmm. and I but I I remember when like starting when I, I I was getting better. So maybe like in my second year of therapy, maybe even third or something. I think maybe I did four years. Uh he I started kind of getting a little bit jealous of him. I'm like, he wakes up every morning. Oh, and he gets this Being just awesome god damn it yes i mean he's basically like a superhero you know like changing people's lives right and left or whatever and i was i just wish that my life could have even a semblance of the impact or meaning that his life did right and it's interesting because like again like you cannot orchestrate to that though you just have yeah. to be got, you know i used to always say this when i was a, a music teacher is that the great thing about music is even if you're just playing like high school French horn or something, you play the French horn differently than anybody else plays. You know, you think about yeah. like Kurt Cobain or something, his guitar playing, you know, you can like right. knock it or praise it or whatever, but it is so unique, you know, and his songwriting is so unique. It's just like in music and art, it's really obvious that like if oh, I paint a tree yeah. and you paint a tree, yeah, they're going to be yeah. really different, you know, like no one can paint a tree the way that i'll paint a tree basically you know they'd have to see me paint it first yeah. you know and then maybe copy it or whatever right but like this is yeah this is yeah. true in a broader sense to life i think like i could not have done what my therapist did i couldn't have just copied it and been like okay now i'll go to therapy school you know and also change lives or whatever and i understand that like other people cannot copy my life uh, but nor should they want to because you know mm -hmm. unless you like going on extended van trips sleeping in a minivan yeah i don't know about you 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 can do something your therapist could never do is talk to all these crazy motherfuckers at their level and yes it's just happen. different it's everybody's different yeah. everybody has different circumstances and it's not even like what you were saying so much as deploying you know i don't even think about deploying i just think you know i'm just going to try to live as authentically myself today and listen to intuition tell me about the things that are right things for me to do best things m medium things like it's an okay thing to do and sometimes wrong things like you know this is not like your, the best use of your resources your time your energy or whatever yeah. and if but just kind of like you, you have uh, to be kind to yourself like i know i'm fucking around right now but i'm just gonna go with it because it's the best i can do right now and fuck it yeah and, and religiously you know this is why i've gotten more religious is because yes it really does take a leap of faith to be like i am willing to leave this job that's toxic leave this relationship that's toxic leave this whatever that you know to leave a former life behind and really just start a new brick by brick is something that our ancestors used to do all the time but it's something that we're not used to unfortunately and we're used to just following this kind of like checklist of things like go to college, you know, get you go get a good internship, you know, like this thing that's supposed mm -hmm. to lead to a happy life. And, you know, maybe or it nothing. does lead to a happy life for some people. Yeah. But why would we think it would apply to us? It was a unique individual, you know, unique in all the world and not this snowflakey special way, but in this way that's just empirically obviously true. No, that's true. I have a question. I don't know if you want to talk about this, but do you actually help like the pe the prisoner people, the ones that are like fucked because they did something so fucked up they were never coming out or all that kind of stuff? Do you deal with, with stuff like that or not really? I'm just I don't, curious how I haven't how yet been involved. Yeah. I have like from like uh, you mean like as a lawyer? Or any kind of capacity or even just kind of like, hey, bro. I get you kind of thing. Yeah, if know. they reach out, then I then I I absolutely do. But it's not an area that I have gotten involved in a lot, but it's an area that I completely support. You know, very much I, support this idea that we're all dynamic people, that we all change, we all make mistakes. 
And, you know, if somebody's changed, we should allow them to change. How different are they than those of us who've not really done anything particularly egregious, I guess? You know, I think in kind of talking about like things in terms of a spectrum too, like when does somebody become an alcoholic? You know, like what, where is that line? Yeah. And I think it's kind of like a little bit with the spectrum of personality disorders too. Like I do understand that people uh, in some ways, you know, I was talking to Ari about this last night you know, about high functioning versus low functioning. And on the one hand, you're like, oh yeah, low functioning, which we might think of, okay, somebody who has a really hard time not doing things that are criminal and ending up in prison. Yeah, repeatedly, yeah. So somebody in a forensic setting might, uh, you know, depending on the, the nature, not everybody in a forensic setting necessarily would be low functioning and vice versa. Not everybody who's outside of a forensic setting are high functioning, but like, yeah, it sucks to kind of be them because they're, they're stuck, but it also sucks to be us high functioning <laughs> because oh, fuck yeah. we're equally as stupid <laughs> doing things, <laughs> you know, like out in the wild or whatever to where we can just like ruin our lives, you know, like snap or whatever, at least probably if you're, you know, maybe this is like t- overly simplistic, but you know, it, it, I just mean, uh, it's, they, they're not so different. They're, they're mostly different contexts. I don't think they're so different mentally. I think that they struggle probably my, my guess is that especially low functioning people, there's more comorbidity there, uh, mm-hmm. in the sense that it's just a little bit more complicated for them to sort everything out about what's going on, their impulses, where are they coming from, you know, because if you have that on top of like any little thing, you know, imagine Mm -hmm. it would be like untangling the worst of knots, you know, like, what is this, Mm -hmm. what is this here for, (laughs) you know, what what is going on here, you know, and it, I think it would just be difficult if you don't have the resources to, to kind of identify it. And if you, especially like most people that I talk to, uh, like via Zoom or like, you know, when I meet people in person are self-aware, like high mm-hmm. self-awareness for our condition, mm-hmm. I think. So mm-hmm. I don't think necessarily that like these Zoom interviews are representative of the self-awareness that you'd see in the general population. I think that's oh, yeah. self-selection happening, you know, that that's people true. who are self-aware are the ones that are contacting me. And that people who are less self-aware. So I think that's a major difference is probably self-awareness. That's just my guess, you know, but it is kind of sad because all these people want to say, okay, like psychopathy is such a terrible problem in our society. And it's like, Hmm. well, then find a cure, you know, yeah. like, why aren't you supporting a cure? It's almost like they don't want there to be a cure because they want to keep saying as somebody commented on a recent YouTube video that if you murder somebody, then you are a psychopath, at least in that moment. I was like, hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, I whatever that means. I the reason I ask is about this spectrum is that because I feel so far removed from that spectrum. And, and so uh, if you had had experience talking with people at that deep end, and then some of us who are maybe more self-aware or mm-hmm. more domesticated is how I would put it. Um, like, do you still see an affinity there? Like, uh, you know, like, I mean, affinity by commonality or like, yes. Like, thread, like oh, yeah. Uh huh. Well, think about kind of like the, even the things that we have said, you said, okay, you know, you never stole anything, but it's not true. You know, I used to say that too. I never stole anything until I realized I had like this crazy shoplifting ring during college, you know? (laughs) And I didn't think of it as shoplifting. I thought of it as just exploiting loopholes, but like, what what else was I doing? You know, like I ended up in like, uh, like somebody's office being interrogated about something and they're like when did you buy this and i was like <laughs> wednesday last wednesday or whatever and it was just a total shot in the dark you know and they did find a purchase for wednesday so that's the only reason why they let me go and didn't Holy get me shit. out of school yeah and that i totally wow. forgot about that until i remembered it because somebody was like yeah have you stolen i was like no then i started no being like, <laughs> have i not stolen <laughs> You know, speaking oh, of not that. having a coherent personal narrative, I mean, it's just hard to kind of remember that sort of stuff. So just, I i mean, that is also what they experience. They also experience okay. that lack of personal narrative. You know, they okay. also experience this, uh, this lack of uh, like sense of self, the boredom, the, the need for stimulation to like alleviate the boredom because it's so maddening. 
it's it just like eats the brain or whatever the boredom does yeah. you know mm -hmm. and so you just imagine okay they're let's say they feel the boredom a little bit worse or let's say they have like less uh you know like clean impulse yeah activity yeah. yeah or anything's messing up with uh, in addition to this with their impulse control or their their self-awareness or something then it's it's not actually that different you know okay yeah and but are they are they like scary or whatever i guess not um, i mean that's another thing you read about i guess i'm asking this because i was recently looking at some book about and um, the forensic shit and these people are all like Oh, I went in there and the hair stood on end and it was like so frightening and and I just feel like that would not happen to me and I, I would assume that wouldn't happen to you, but maybe it does. I don't know. It's well, weird. also kind of like what we were talking about earlier, you know, this is kind of like shooting from the hip, but like at what point do you become too far gone? You know, mm -hmm. I think some yeah. people are too far gone, just like, you know, this person I know who's been struggling with mental health issues where I'm like, you're, you're mm -hmm. like really dipping your toes in the water of too far gone. If you keep going down kind of these like delusional ways or whatever, if you keep, you know, remaining separated from reality this way, mm -hmm. because there's, there is such a thing, I think, you know, we never know, like, I could never say this person, yes, this person, no, but just statistically, you know, just from what we know about yeah and this is true too like with addicts you know some of them go to rehab once and they're they're fine or whatever and some of them do not ever recover they end That's up true. dying from the disease right from the disorder and so it's just Leaving really hard there. to kind of know but yes like these people they they maybe they didn't think about it or maybe they didn't care for whatever reason when we were talking about it sets a precedence for behavior you yes. know like if you do kind of the let's say we are novelty seeking yes right because of the boredom and right. if, if you kind of don't check that you know and don't kind of like start the violin for instance you know right. and like find another way to channel these things like start sk snow skiing you know or whatever yeah. else like i did you know yeah. then then what what do you channel it into you know and also socioeconomic levels you know oh, so yeah, it is true that like you can just imagine somebody like I I think at my peak I probably you know I just always ask people you know just scale one to ten because I do scale of one to ten for everything how good is Chick Fil A yeah. scale of one to ten mm -hmm. <laughs> Chick Fil A is oh. a ten guys <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. yeah <laughs> so okay, yeah. yeah so I always say where was I on the spectrum maybe like tops at the my very top like eight and a half and is it kind of weird to meet somebody who's like nine or nine and a half or even I've probably met you know one or two tens where I'm like okay. this is a little chilling you know because okay. you're just okay. like even less invested in you know other people <laughs> than I am <laughs> oh that is true that would be like wow huh yeah, they, they do seem even more alien, but you're kind of like, but okay, not such an unfamiliar alien where I'm like, whatever, but I do think it's hard to kind of, you know, they call this like you, I think you're aware of like apologists in religion, right? Theology. Yeah, sure. yeah, oh, yeah. You, you start from the end and you kind of like reason backward and like, how did we get here? You know, right. and I sometimes think that like, if you, if you think of psychopaths that way, then that's not always going to be useful, you know, <laughs> because you start with these ones that are in prison or whatever. And, you know, they're, I don't know that they are the stereotypical psychopath. I think they might be outliers. Could be, could very well be. And, but, you know, the stereotypical is such an outlier in and of itself that yes. it, it, it becomes preposterous to align oneself with that like yes. oh Ted Bundy or Hannibal Lecter or whatever and, and you're just like <laughs> and again I think it's important to say like this is what I've kind of gleaned from Arya's therapist is that therapists are becoming increasingly disinclined to diagnose people who, with personality disorders with a specific personality disorder because there's so much about. overlap yeah so they there's, there's so many stupid armchair diagnosers out there too god knows yes so they're now kind of saying okay you have personality you have a personality disorder personality disorder otherwise unspecified right oh, and okay. that's the trend is to say okay you know we not everybody has these all these uh, categories so why put them in this little category just say they have a personality disorder that has these features you know mm -hmm. yeah 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 and that also de-glamorizes it too because that's 
also an issue at times. Oh yeah. I mean, my last therapist, you know, the recently deceased one, he, he never That's diagnosed true. me with antisocial personality disorder. He diagnosed me personality disorder, otherwise unspecified comma <laughs> with features of antisocial right, right, personality right. disorder. He said Asperger's was one and, uh, huh. What is it? Obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Because he, I mean, I always think my obsessive fault, uh, thoughts were attributable to like sociopathy or something. He was like, well, you know, obsessive compulsive personality disorder also is characterized by, you know, kind of like you get a thought in your head and it's hard to give it up. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been the whole like, I still have the sidewalk crack thing. I, I try not to. And yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why like the violin is so good. Um, I know this girl locally. She's like 12 or 13 and she's playing the violin. She's pretty good, but she's right at that age where either she's going to stick with it or give it up. Yeah. And I diagnose her. She's going to give it up. Why? She, to me, is a very solid, straightforward, somehow well-adjusted human being. And <laughs> you have to be like, like, I mean, the word is not the right word, but neurotic as fuck to have the thing with the violin happen. I'm sure it'll break her dad's heart, but I would tell him, I'd be like, I'm sorry. I don't think she's going to keep up with it. <laughs> this motherfucking thing you know what i'm saying yeah maybe she'll like come back to it or something but you know glenn gould you know he's uh yeah. speaking of neurotic but like also my heart you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the pianist yeah, glenn cool. gould and oh, yeah. uh man what else was i thinking of like neuroticism oh i once read a new yorker article that the reason why they somebody surmised somebody had a theory about this the reason why african uh marathon runners dominate is because so many of them come from like these very painful situations war torn you know mm. lost lost family or whatever and that the Everything. running is like a way for them to like process all this trauma and they're like so you you can't get just like a normal you know american who like was raised in a middle class right. <laughs> household right, right, right. like with right. no trauma and expect them to compete against this i was like this is interesting <laughs> was that jimmy fallon because he was talking about epigenetics and he's talking about the people like second third fourth generation holocaust survivors oh man oh a lot of them are just obese and it's the same thing oh really yeah. interesting no i hadn't heard about uh, this but these are like first generation like you know rwandans you know or like you oh, know, sure, whatever sure. yeah okay. oh, yeah they were yeah. like six when their their parents were killed in front of them now they're like a champion <sighs> marathonist yeah. Oh God. I mean, how could you not stop running? Damn. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of, it's interesting you say that about the violinist girl. Yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, that's how it is. And, and I, I, it's like, because to me, like the violin and kind of, it's like a weird basket to put whatever compulsive, obsessive, uh, paranoid, uh, bored, I mean, induced, uh, novelty seeking, um, bizarre brain machination shit it's like this great basket to just dump it all in there mm -hmm. and and like and i guess i'm talking about it now because i had demonstrated it when i was a kid the reason i'm not completely fucked up i think is because of the violin right and so now i'm trying to like i'm going through reverse puberty now i'm, I'm in my mid 40s so that's part of the thing for me mm -hmm. and so i feel like maybe that's going to help me with that also I you know but it's it's interesting and it's good this is why i think we need to talk to more people who aren't so far gone you know mm -hmm. not that not to say that some of these people are i far gone but maybe maybe some of them are right because it's like well if the violin mattered so much to you i think that's important to know and to try to direct people children who kind of are struggling with certain things towards things like the violin or if not the violin you know skiing or if not skiing you know yeah so oh, that's yeah. why i think it is interesting like the the weird focus on the most extreme in some ways is like the opposite of what you would think society would want to do uh <laughs> because because you, you what do you want to do with your children you want your children to grow up this way you don't want them to know the any like uh youth therapist or children therapist for children to to know that you know this has worked in the past with other people just learn the violin Right, 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 right. It's very interesting. And just the other day, I saw that there was the Atlantic article. It's kind of old about the children who were going to grow up. I'm sure you saw it. It was, they talked about this girl and this guy who was like a mortician. And that guy was a trip. 
No, I didn't see oh, it. Oh, I don't know. Huh? I'll have to send it, but it was just like one was interviewing this 11 year old child who was basically held child and tried to choke her sister to death. Uh -huh. And the other was this guy who grew up to be a mortician. Oh, and yeah. That guy, and, and I remember that because he had the religion thing. He found Jesus. That yeah. was part of what pulled him out. And so I don't remember what my point was. Um, but something about that. Oh, just like those kids, like that girl. Hard to imagine here, play the violin and stop choking your sister somehow. I don't know. Yeah, but so. maybe it's like Taekwondo, you know, who knows? But that's, yeah, yeah that's why I am like, we, we don't know. There's so many things yeah. like, I never want to come on here and make it sound like I do know. I mostly want to say like, we don't know. And we need more yeah. funding and more interest and more open-mindedness and more just like the scientific process, let, you know, and more, more focus on not just like a narrow subsection of the disorder, you know, and not less stigma. So more people can come <laughs> forward. You know, that's, that's kind of my thing is like, yeah. If you had a child who's like this, wouldn't you want to know? If you had a society oh, yeah. that was like this, wouldn't you want to know? <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, my, my fucking mom, like, they didn't know what the fuck to do with me at all. Yeah. At all. No clue. Anyways. When you're there, yeah. To kind of wrap yeah. up now, do you have, is there anything yeah, else? <laughs> no, that's it. I've been wanting to go for a while because it's 4.30. I need to go do stuff. But oh, you need to go do stuff? Okay. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, I could just keep going here, but no, it's super great fabulous and thanks so much no problem and uh, maybe we'll check in on you again in a few months to see how your your goals with regard to your relationships and just letting people be and have the reactions that they have to you and to the relationship how that those goals are going yeah and the music thing too for and sure. the music thing yeah. and violin okay those two we'll follow up with <laughs> there you go. also thanks so much emmy have a great evening or morning thank you you too bye yeah. bye